Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So I have a great appreciation for all of those who are early morning people who wake up and who uh, are passionate enough to come and talk about what I believe is the most important issue facing our state uh, as well as the city of Detroit. My name is Tanya Allen and I have the pleasure of serving as the president and the CEO of the Skillman Foundation and we are um, very grateful that we have the ability to host this session this morning. So I want to begin with a few uh, words um, about what I think, how, how I believe we ought to frame this issue. So in the city of Detroit, we fought this battle, and I think in the state as well, we fought the battle whether Detroit's existence and strength is good for Michigan. Enlightened or begrudgingly, we have come to acknowledge that a strong Detroit equates to a stronger Michigan. Now, we must pair that conclusion with the inevitable fact that a strong cities must have strong schools. And there must be a diversity of schools. The schools have to be traditional public schools, public charter schools, and private schools. That's what good cities have. They have a system of schools. Unfortunately, in Detroit, we went from a school system, and I often used to say kiddingly, to a system of schools, but the unfortunate fact is that there is no system at all in Detroit. The Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children set out to address this, and to address this belief and try and devise a plan to accomplish it. So we all understood clearly that if we continue to fight each other, that we were never gonna win for children. So we tried to set aside adult interests and focus and prioritize on children. And we also debated and decided that we were gonna take on the toughest issues um, that some people said to us, there's no way you'll ever get anybody to buy into those ideas. Um, but we felt like it was important for us to have those conversations and if we were gonna take an opportunity to try and reset education, we were gonna take a real opportunity. We weren't gonna play with this um, and move forward. And we also knew that if we didn't take this on at this particular point, like all of you know, that the recovery in Detroit will be temporary. And if it's not temporary, at least we know it's not gonna be inclusive and it's not gonna be a recovery that in 30 years we'll all be proud of. So the proposals that we set forth, I think attempted to do a couple of things. Uh, the first was to improve teaching and learning for children and for their teachers by stabilizing the environment and relying on academic performance, not ideology or governance as the true measure of success for students. The second thing we attempted to do was to really make sure that taxpayer dollars were going to the issues that we thought was important. So instead of paying debtors, maybe we could pay, <laughs> invest in classrooms. Instead of um, facilitating and funding new infrastructure that we would have infrastructure um, that really served all children. So I'm not gonna go through all of the recommendations for the coalition, but I do wanna set this frame because I think one of the things that the coalition modeled for the city, and I believe modeled for the state, is that even if you disagree on issues, you can have a civil conversation about these issues and to really talk and focus on a set of solutions. And so today's debate, I would say, or I don't know, they're sitting at a table, I um, threatened to get them teacups. Uh, to make it look <laughs> even more civil, uh, uh, is really about us debating these issues and talking about solutions. You all know that we're in the midst of a legislative um, debate and discussion in Lansing that's pretty hot right now. Um, and I quite honestly wish that they could do what we're doing now, thinking about how we come to a set of solutions with um, a bipartisan um, uh, approach to answering these tough questions and understanding that in every perspective there is truth. So um, with that, I want to just um, do two uh, small things before uh, we get started. The first thing I want to do is to acknowledge um, a few of the educational leaders who are in the room today. So we have coalition um, co-chairs, uh, David Hecker, Michigan AFT, John Ricolta, 
who is present here with us today. And I don't think I see anyone else. I also want to acknowledge uh, Mayor Mike Duggan for his extraordinary leadership. Uh, most mayors know. I remember I told, yeah, give him a hand clap. Um, I remember saying to the mayor when we were talking about these issues, and he knew it. I didn't have to tell him this. I was like, you know, uh, the mayors who usually take on this stuff don't get reelected. <laughs> Are you willing to take that risk? And uh, he said, if I don't take this risk, I don't need to be reelected. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and then lastly, I do want to just acknowledge, I think uh, Superintendent Alicia Merriweather is in the room and uh, for Detroit Public Schools, I want to acknowledge and thank her for all of her hard work. And then the last person I'd like to acknowledge, and I also would like to bring him up, is Senator Jeff Hansen. And I think um, as we talk about taking risk, being civil, debating issues, coming up with solutions, being champions for children, Senator Jeff Hansen has shown us the prototype and how you do that. Um, so Senator Hansen, if you do not know, is from the western side of the state. He has been leading the charge around having a thoughtful discussion about how we improve the educational landscape for all children in the city of Detroit. So I want to just acknowledge Senator Jeff Hansen and have him come up to say a few words. Wow, good morning, that's uh, really nice. Thank you for having me here today. This is, it's great to see such a turnout for this because this is one of the most important things we will ever do for the state of Michigan. As we have worked towards a solution, we know we've already started. We've helped get Detroit past the problems that they had before. Uh, God bless the mayor, he's done a great job with working with the city to make sure that we have a strong Detroit. And, and it's absolutely true, we have to have a strong Detroit to have a strong city, or have a strong state. I personally come from the real west side, which means we have shoreline over in my district. <laughs> and so, coming from there, I, I really felt that as I looked at the coalition's um, paper that they put out back in March of 2015, we needed somebody that could look at it and not be inside and be part of everything. So I felt that as we looked at how we were going to fix this, it kind of hit me one day. I, I think what it is, I have to stop drinking. <laughs> but it's, it's a matter of the importance of this hit me. And I sat down with my chief of staff and I said, we're going to do this. This is something that we need to be part of. So I went to leadership and they looked at me and they went, are you nuts? <laughs> and so then I went to the governor. I said, I'm gonna be the lead. I said, you do whatever you want. When you give me the bill, it's mine. I'm gonna be the lead. And then I, then I sat down with my Detroit colleagues and said, what do you want your school to look like, your schools? They're not my schools. And from the very beginning, I made sure that I said to them, is if you want me to fix this for you, you got a long wait because it's not happening. But if you want me to stand next to you to fix it, I'll be there all day. But the most important part is we had a thoughtful sit down, talk about what do we really need to have to happen to have a, a program, to have a citywide school system that actually works? And holy cow, did we open a can of worms as we started that. But it was, it was worth it. I've spent, oh my gosh, I've been in Detroit a few times. <laughs> A lot of hours, because it's so important to go down and talk to the people who it affects. Lansing doesn't have all the answers. In fact, 
a lot of the answers escape us. We have to go and talk to the people that it affects. Because if we don't, we're putting our values on the people that have to live it every day. And I've told them over and over that they have to buy in. Detroit has to buy in or will not be successful. Success matters by how much of an, uh, what quality education the kids get. And we have to remember that we're talking about about 100,000 kids between the charters and the traditional schools. And we need to make sure every single one of them gets the education that they deserve. Because if we don't, shame on us. So we need to step up. We need to make this happen. We put together a program that I spent, I'm going to guess, a year putting together, working with every group that wanted to sit down between the parents, the teachers, the uh, Excellent Schools Detroit, um, anybody that would sit down with me, the school board, the mayor, the superintendents, everybody that would sit down with me because I wanted to know some of their thoughts. And so we put together a program in the countless hours that we sat and negotiated between what we wanted to look like, what it should look like. And I thought we came up with a pretty good program, a pretty good bill that did make it through the Senate. And I guess one of my proudest things on this whole thing is that it passed 13 Republicans, eight Democrats. It has to be bipartisan. It has to be a solution that works, and we have to make sure we put the kids first. So thank you for having me here tonight, or tonight, this morning. <laughs> Haven't quite had enough coffee yet, but I'm working on it. But it, it's just, it's, it's so, you know, it just does my heart good to see so many people show up because this is, this is so important. So gentlemen, you know, be civil. <laughs> I'll be sitting right there in case you say things that are less than that. And we have to remember we're all in this together. It's not one against the other. It's all of us working towards a common solution. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, and then I also was just reminded that there were a few other people I should have introduced. So there are members of the Coalition for the um, Future of Detroit School Children's uh, Steering Committee, steering, steering committee members here. Would you guys please just quickly stand for me or if you worked on the coalition in any form or fashion. Uh, then I heard Judge Rhodes was here, and then I just decided that everybody's important. So turn and just give everybody a hand clap, because <laughs> you're all important. So, um, so I'm going to turn it now. We'll watch a quick video. And after that video, I'm going to turn it over um, to Mary Kramer. Everybody knows Mary. Mary is the um, consummate professional. Uh, you also know that she is the publisher for Cranes. Uh, and full disclosure, she's also a board member of the Skillman Foundation, and I am gratefully privileged by that, um, her willingness to serve with us on this issue. So we'll turn it to Mary, and then we'll turn it to the gentleman to get started. Thank you. I do not understand how any city can talk about coming back without talking schools, communities, and education. When you have good schools, you have good communities. The children that we are graduating, unfortunately, a lot of them are not prepared for college. I have a 20-year-old son who is at his second attempt of going to college. When he left in 2013, he needed so many remediation courses to just be able to keep up. There are a lot of parents that I work with, a lot of parents that I talk to, that's a disenchanted and a, a lot of reason that a lot of parents are moving their kids because they have no, no say so in the schools. Parents need to be involved. When you close our neighborhood schools, now our children have to bus to Midtown, downtown area. This might be an eight, nine mile ride for them where they have to transfer two, three, maybe even four buses. 
So when you look at that fact, a lot of our young people was up and out in the streets as early as 5 a.m as early as 5 a.m. We need a system of schools that work for the, for the students and the families that they service. We can't afford to have schools that open and close on a dime and nobody knows about it. It just doesn't work. It's not fair to have schools two or three blocks around from each other or K through eight and they're competing for students that they can't even fill up one school. We need schools that work together. I'm sick of the, the lines being drawn, the division, DPS against charter. It's, it's, as a parent, it's really gotten on my nerves because the fact of the matter is Detroit kids, parents are choosing. They're choosing to send their kids to charter. They're choosing to send their kids to DPS. We need somebody, a neutral somebody, to just oversee all of the schools, just to make sure everybody's playing by the rules, just to make sure everybody has the same set of standards, just to make sure that we don't have schools pushing kids out, just to make sure that we don't have schools that are having enrollment uh, dates that nobody knows about. It's unfair. And we need somebody to just level this playing field. And we need it now. We need it now. Good morning. I'm Mary Kramer. I was introduced by uh, Tanya a moment ago, and I'm going to be the moderator this morning. And I encourage you to look at your own tables because there are three by five cards. And if you have questions for uh, the two um, panelists here, that you can uh, write your question, raise your hand, and somebody will come and collect it. Um, one other disclosure: um, uh, Tanya mentioned my professional uh, job is at Cranes and a Skillman Foundation board member, and I'm also a board member of Grand Valley State University, which actually charters schools. So I um, wanted to get that on the table as well. Um, the format this morning is we have two folks up here on uh, two sides of the issue that seems to be the obstacle in legislation in Lansing. Um, John Ricolta is a co-chair of the coalition, and Dan Quisenberry is the president of MAPSA, the Michigan Association of Public Schools Academies and that is the charter uh, school lobbying group. And so two different perspectives, and each of them are going to be uh, held to a time limit of representing their views. It's gonna be kind of a debate, not the presidential kind. And that, uh, Tanya mentioned having teacups here, and I don't think we want the tea party image here at all. So we're, we, we have bottles of water instead. Um, so they're going to represent their different points of view. There will be rebuttals, and then we're gonna go into some questions. So to start, um, let me ask uh, John, uh, to open with, he will have three minutes, um, then Dan will have three minutes opening, then we're gonna give rebuttals, and then we'll uh, go from there. So, John, you have the opening floor. Great, thank you very much, great to be here. So I brought a handout, you know, I always come prepared. So if you guys would just quickly pass these out, don't start this until they get the handouts. This is, okay? Uh, while I'm passing these out, I wanted to just mention, I'll come over here with a group of papers too, that uh, Dan's not my adversary here today. You are. All of us. I passed the ball out. Everybody's my adversary because there is so much indifference on this subject in our country, in our state, 
and specifically in Detroit, Michigan, that it pains me. I looked up the word discipline, what it meant. There's two meanings. One is a branch of knowledge or study. The second one is the practice of training people, us, to obey tried and proven rules of success, to correct undisciplined behavior and conduct. And so what's going on with the mic? Yeah, I know it is. I can, I can. All right. Technology. You want to try mine, John? No, I'm fine. I think we'll, we'll keep going and see if it's okay. I put it up on my lapel. Maybe it was where it was located. Is it better there? Yeah. Okay, great. I don't think it's so great. So let me just put a couple of facts on the table. 16 of 17 years of deficit spending, $833 million in the hole. 67% of the kids miss 40 days a year. 9% overall proficiency in the Detroit school systems. The inability of the state to fill 65,000 highly skilled jobs and another 40,000 perhaps not quite so skilled. There is no discipline in our system. This is the root cause. It's all of us and we're not demanding better. To blame the charter schools, to blame the house is misguided. It is all of us. Secondly, we're great at spin. It's what we're all about. And so I want to say right out, I'm no fan of the Detroit public school system and I'm no fan of the charter schools. I am here representing the kids. That's who needs the help. And there are two significant issues that are standing in the way of a resolution in Lansing and not. The first is the amount of money needed to right size the system. And that's what I passed out on my chart. You will notice that we have had this humongous deficit spending. And I submit that it will continue into the future regardless of what happens in Lansing this week or next. At $33 million plus 515, the system is still broke. It will remain broke. It will go nowhere. I also submit that 515 plus 200 barely does it. It does give the local, local district a fighting chance. And if you want to point out just a couple of things on here that just sort of, my wife told me, take a Valium. You don't need to like go <laughs> off, off, the, off the edge here. But I want you to look at 2016 that says there's a 20, I can't read it, $26 million deficit. That is so disingenuous. That is because they have not filled 380 positions in the Detroit public school system, of which 180 teachers are short. And the reason they didn't do that is because they don't have the money to fill the positions. The district is almost 400 people short. They saved $40 million. The deficit for 2016 coming up should be 70 million, not 28. And that's what we're dealing with on all of these facts. Everybody spins the facts to prove their case. Going forward, we need $200 million, not 50, not 75, not 130. We already compromised from 300 back to 200 to get the Senate bill passed. And there's a list of what hasn't been done for the last 50 years. John, Let's just take boilers for a second. John, John, My name's Donald Trump. John. John. We, okay. 50, 50 boilers are 50 years old. We spend $8 million on operating engineers to watch the boilers 24 hours a day so they don't explode, so the kids are safe. There are hundreds of issues like that in the schools. And for us not to get and, the $68 million is a travesty. We and John, you're out of time. Thank you. Okay. Dan, I want to applaud that you're here today. This is going to be a great exchange. Now you have three minutes for your opening remarks. I, I appreciate that, Mary. And uh, as John just uh, uh, experienced, we have so much to say and there's so little time. So I too uh, made some notes because I want to make sure I was uh, as efficient as possible. 
But uh, there are a lot of things we agree on, all of us, as has already been stated. We certainly have a goal of increasing. I'm going to move mine too. John, would you find the hell work better up there? Stop the clock. Uh huh. <laughs> we all have the goal of increasing academic outcomes for kids. I mean, that needs to be said. Um, we also have goals of improving access to quality schools across the city of Detroit. Uh, I agree there needs to be more accountability for schools. Charter schools in the city of Detroit agree there needs to be more accountability for charter schools and for charter school authorizers. I want to suggest that during our discussion, you step back a bit uh, and, and decide for yourself if the ideas that we're talking about really will work. We have a moment in time where we can get this right or not. And here's what I would suggest you do. On one side of a ledger, ledger in your mind, put performance. Student outcomes, teaching and learning. Okay, thank you. Uh, on one side of a ledger in your mind, put performance. Student outcomes, teaching and learning, addressing the challenges that our students face, like special education, the social service issues that uh, challenge our students and kids in the city of Detroit. On the other side, what I would call governance. Adults, politics, power, who controls the systems, who controls the money that goes with those systems, and how is that gonna be distributed and work? Okay, it's obvious. What we want is performance. However, this discussion, as we've already uh, talked about, has already spun into uh, focusing on one issue, a very narrow, issue over the last 18 months actually around governance, around a proposed expansion of city authority into the management of schools. It's called the Detroit Education Commission. That's singularly where we oppose uh, the Senate plan. It's additional governance, not new governance, not replacement governance, additional governance. Additional adults politically appointed that make management decisions that schools and boards should make for schools, like openings, closings, facilities. There are likely other services that would be voluntarily aggregated around that commission, like enrollment and transportation and other things. 10 seconds. Why would we assume that this will have a positive impact on student outcomes? Will the DEC be involved in teaching and learning? The mayor says he won't run schools, and I believe him. But will a DEC manage attendance issues across the city? Will it make decisions parents would or should make? Can a DEC respect and handle the diversity of the Detroit issues, the diversity of our neighborhoods, the diversity of our communities in the city? I don't see how a DEC can Time do that. Time is up. I'm so sorry, Dan, but you're going to have another chance and we'll have a lot of Q&A too. So John, uh, you have one minute for a rebuttal for anything that Dan has, has uh, spoken to. Dan, Dan focused on governance. And uh, who's ever doing the governance today, it's not working. 67% of the kids miss 40 days a year. The proficiency even in the charter schools is only 14%. They beat D uh, DPS by nine, 5%. The average in the United States is 68. Whatever we have today isn't working and we can't wait any longer. The DEC is the best hope and it is supported by a vast number of people. Democrats, Republicans, labor, management, suburban, city, black, white, Every business organization, except for the Michigan Chamber, we all realize you have to have a model going forward that's different. Okay, that was, that was very good. That was under a minute, John. I, I'm, I'm very impressed. I learned. <laughs> Dan, one minute. Uh, the DEC is the issue. Let's sweep that aside. Let's make our systems, yeah. Let's make our systems work. Uh, it is not vastly supported. Even the, uh, the survey polling that was released yesterday shows that uh, a, a, a large number of people oppose it or are undecided. So if it's not a good idea, let's try doing other things. What we do need to do is improve performance, make sure schools are held accountable. We need new state standards. We need to make sure schools are funded equitably. We need to be recruiting talent. Where are those 185 teachers going to come from? I can tell you, and we support funding 
DPS and giving them startup capital, that's going to give the ability to go to our charter schools in the city of Detroit and hire our teachers. That's okay. We need to do that. But where are we going to attract new teaching talent in this city? I'm not sure a DEC will do that. Okay, also very, very good. All right, let's get into a few of the questions here. Um, first of all, when we're talking about uh, the, the two issues that seem to separate its governance, the Education Commission, and also how much uh, the state will invest to help reduce the, the debt load that is preventing more dollars from going into the Detroit Public Schools classrooms. Dan, there was a lot of publicity in the last few days about the mayor's um, invitation to an event to have charter operators come and talk through some of these issues. The mayor's in the room. Mayor, would you like to show your knuckles? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, Dan, uh, you, you sent a letter out, and that did get a little buzz, in terms of what you thought the mayor's goal was, and the phrase that you used, bare knuckle, big city politics. Tell us what you think, what, what, what was your goal there? What, what is your objection to the mayor trying to bring the charter operators and gain some ground around the perspective of why the Education Commission is, is needed? There are 65 charter schools in the city of Detroit. Uh, 20 that were invited to that meeting is my understanding. So there's not, or there's not agreement amongst the charter community, even amongst DPS, about whether this is a good idea. It's a very difficult thing to invite anyone in. Mr. Mayor, you're the mayor, and I respect uh, your authority. I respect, as others have said, that you have a chance to be involved in solving education. Let's acknowledge, though, it's a pressured situation when you're invited in to say, are you supportive of this? Are you supportive of that? I want to invite you to a press conference. We've decided not to do that. I don't want to put school leaders in that position. So part of the idea, Mary, was if you want to put some political pressure on somebody, put it on me. Our school leaders should not be standing in a press conference talking about political ideas. They should be running our schools and improving our outcomes. Okay. Um, John, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me about all this uh, in terms of the p politics behind whether there's an education commission and, and, or not, is that it seems that the charter lobby, um, there's money behind it, and a lot of the money behind it is in your political party. Um, you're a leader in the political party, uh, the Republican Party. You've raised a lot of money for the Republican Party. What kind of conversations do you have with the people who are backing the, um, the po politics behind the uh, charter school's opposition to an education commission? Don't you get any traction? Uh, the appropriate word is was. Ah. I was the leader. I'm no longer. Could you use the mic? Because I don't think everybody can hear. OK, is that better? Yeah. I said, she said, I am the leader of something. I was. That's past tense. I've divorced myself because of this issue. That's number one. So I'm not getting a lot of great feedback. Uh, so I, I can't answer that, but I do want to point out this. We've had our proposal on the table for one year. There's nothing from anybody that comes close to it. All this stuff, I have these grandiose ideas of how we can fix it. Where are they? Where are those ideas? The House bill that provided $33 million so we could declare bankruptcy in September? That's their idea? Or just no DEC, but nothing else? What about where are all these new ideas coming forth? They're disingenuous. Dan, you talked about you know, that the charter school operators should be focused on operating charter schools. And you, you, you oppose the mayor's engagement in an in a, a appointed education commission. So this system, though, of unlimited openings of, of charter schools, that's not the, the national norm. There are many cities and states around the country that do have some kind of governance structure, that extra layer that you described. And the schools seem to be performing better. I mean, the state as a whole in Michigan is dead last, and according to the Education Trust Midwest, on the national testing scores. So why, why can it work in other states and other cities, but you don't think it would work or be appropriate here in Michigan and in Detroit? We need to make it work better, Mary. Uh, nothing I, we say says there shouldn't be changes, shouldn't be improvement. It's about making the systems that are in place function. Let's hold authorizers accountable for outcomes. The reality is the vast majority of openings and closings have come from DPS and the emergency managers, not charter schools in the city over the last six years. 20 openings, 15 closures, six net new schools. That's what authorizers have done. So let's make that work better. 
Do we need to require them to engage the community so we really understand how that's working? Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't need a DEC to do that, not additional adults, not additional politics. And on the academic performance thing, ladies and gentlemen, this ought to be a shocking thing to you. As John said, our worst enemy here is us. That's not just charter performance. The performance of charter schools in the city of Detroit is very important. It is above. Uh, Stanford University says additional three months of learning at an average charter school in the city. That means average means the higher performing schools are getting better than that. What's sad is all of our schools in, this, in the state of Michigan are in the bottom third in this country, in the bottom third of the world. We ought to be shocked and dismayed, and that's in the school districts. Our own children go to wherever you live in this state. So it's about increasing standards and expectations for all of our schools. That's a statewide system. It's something we've been proposing for three years. I would love this crowd, this community, this chamber, the people in this organization standing up in Lansing and saying, now is the time to have real standards and consistent standards like Massachusetts and Florida and uh, places like Colorado. That's why they're performing, and that's why they're beating us, standards. Could we get both of you, one or both of you, to, to describe the difference between the version of the uh, uh, proposal that came through the press conference yesterday, the mayor and the charter operators publicly talking about a different kind of Detroit Education Commission that differed from the Senate version in some important ways. Can, can one of you discuss what, what those ways are? Uh, there certainly was, uh, as I heard, and it was, uh, I was able to be at the press conference, certainly some uh, at the press conference, the charter operators saying they didn't support, Senator, with all due respect, didn't support the Senate version of the DEC, but they were willing to look at something different. And then there was talk of uh, amendments to that Senate version. As I've seen this in the last 24 hours, it doesn't look a whole lot different, Mary. So I do think, as the legislature is debating this, there'll be discussion about something different, whatever that might be. So there were three, uh, three issues. First of all, in the Senate bill, uh, it was unclear or adv disadvantageous to the charter schools. If a DPS school was closed, what would happen to that building? Uh, the thought being that it would probably stay closed. Uh, this new idea would be to make the buildings available to anybody. That's number one. Number two was the renewal of the five-year. By the way, the DEC is only for five years. So it's a basically an experiment. It's not forever. Five years. There's this one little clause that said that, that the, somebody in Lansing in the administration could renew that after five years based on, and they gave all these criteria. And one of the criteria was how many kids were in DPS. Of course, everybody cried, cried foul, said, oh, so you're going to uh, base the uh, extension of, uh, of the uh, DEC on whether there are enough students. And so therefore, the conclusion is you're going to penalize the charter schools. That too has been removed. And there's one other one. And I just had a birthday and I forgot what it was. <laughs> so Dan, maybe, maybe if somebody could uh, just jog my memory. But those are the three things that were removed okay. in order to make it more palatable because these were the three things that we were told were the objections. I keep on going back to this issue. Yes, there is this moment in time. It has to happen. Everybody's had 18 months to make it happen. Where are all these alternative proposals? There aren't any. It only has this one bill, the Senate bill. If we don't pass the Senate bill, I will make a prediction, and you can see it on my chart, we're gonna have enormous student loss this October, and you'll be prepared to go through this whole thing again next year at this conference, because we're gonna be another $150 million in the hold after we've paid off all this debt. So Dan, um, in terms of the, uh, you, you said that you would be in favor of more accountability. Would you support um, not allowing a charter to open a new school if the rating is not an A or a B in, in the metrics that are being used? Uh, Mary, uh, absolutely. That happens uh, through an authorizer's responsibility. Well, Dan, sometimes they open schools that aren't performing like right. that. Then we should hold them accountable for the bad decisions they make. How do you hold them accountable? We have great people serving on university boards I know that are few. looking at the portfolio of those schools. Absolutely, Mary, I don't, I don't mean that in a flippant way. Uh, Grand Valley has a great reputation. Central Michigan has a great reputation. There are some others. But by golly, there are some authorizers that probably have been intentionally working well, but should stop doing charter schools. That's the kind of thing we need to be doing, not additional adults, not the exposure of 
potential city politics into these decisions. Because let's, let's face it, when a school gets closed or when one is opening, it is a high, highly provocative kind of situation. Do we want to expose that to additional politics? Well, here's, here's a fact. Out of the 65 charter schools in the city of Detroit, 70% of them, 70% of those 65 are operated by Detroiters. They don't see a city being taking the schools back. They see the city involvement as being taking it away from communities and neighborhoods. They are making decisions that are right for those parts of the city uh, where they're serving those kids. We need state expectations. Schools are state entities in this state. They're constitutionally driven. They're funded by the state. They should have state expectations and standards. And we should hold people accountable for implementing that, not add redundancy and complication and confusion. Thank you. Uh, John, the, um, one of the sticking points... Can in I answer that one? Can you respond? Th this, yes, is you the li this is the list of closed charter schools since inception. Okay? A total of eight of them have been closed for academic reasons. Of the eight, four of them have been closed by either DPS or Wayne Risa, and only four of them have been closed by the charter school operators in the city of Detroit for academic performance, just four. And there hasn't been a single one closed since 2013, and the performance has fallen off the chart. And if you look on the back of this little deal, you will see there are 40 schools in the city of Detroit who are performing so badly that their fourth grade reading scores proficiency is less than 5%. 20,000 of these kids can't read. Where are all these reforms, other than the ones that the coalition put forth? This is just a delay tactic. To be able to go another year, another two years, we're kicking the can down the road. And that's why I go back to my original statement. If we're not gonna have the discipline sitting in this room to go out and demand change, it will never happen. Okay, Dan, uh, here's a question from the audience. Your own survey shows that 80% of parents aren't satisfied with Detroit schools. 27,000 kids leave the city every day. 90,000 kids have moved out over the past decade. You've said trust parents. Aren't they trying to say something? Uh, we do trust parents. We're trying to make sure they've got great schools to be part of. Um, the fact that they're leaving, we need to increase the performance, we need to hold people accountable. I'm just saying for 70% of the folks, 70,000 families, 55,000, they've chosen charters, uh, they've found that to be a better choice. Can it be improved? Absolutely, it has to be. But I, I want to come back, and this is actually a place where John and I agree. I just don't think we need to expand city authority to do it, but this is a difficult map. If you could see it, you'd understand some of the dynamics of how in the world do we make these decisions? There are schools here that are vastly underperforming, and our authorizer is looking at that and saying, ah, this is the only school in this neighborhood, do I keep it open because it's the only school there, or do I close it because it's academically failing? How do you intervene? This is, this is, Detroit is the only community in the country that has a declining population. Easier to make these decisions when the, the population is increasing. These are tough decisions, folks. So absolutely, Mr. Mayor, and I, I've said this to you personally, so I feel comfortable saying it here, if you called authorizers together, we started talking about these maps. What do we wanna do? Where do we need to do it? How do we make united decisions about these tough decisions? People will show up, they'll get engaged. It doesn't require new statutory authority. It needs to be about holding people accountable. We need higher standards. John, um, one of the things that might be an obstacle in terms of some people's resistance to the Education Commission is they might respect Mayor Duggan, but what happens with the next mayor? Um, so what is the, how do, you, uh, how do you respond to that for the future forward type of question? This bill's only good for five years. Five years. You're making it sound like it's good forever. Mm -hmm. And we have to worry about this mayor in 2050. It's five years. That's it. Number two, if we agree that we're not going, we're going to close these bad schools, and B, we're going to only let charter operators reopen who are A or B, we have an agreement. Where's the disagreement here? We're willing to change. Don't, don't call it the DEC. Call it something else. If we agree on those two things plus the proper amount of money, 
We have an agreement. So where is the debate? Yes. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I've said to several people, um, I may sound paranoid, but you know, they really are out to get me. Uh, my good friend David Hacker here uh, with the Detroit Federation of Teachers, why wouldn't we do that? Because that expanded authority, his members believe I'll take advantage of that. I believe, and our charter schools believe, he'll take advantage of that. We don't need new statutory authority, new vulnerability to do that. Hold people accountable, let's do our jobs. Raise the expectations for folks. We can get that done, doesn't require a DEC. John, there's a question about uh, school funding, and I think um, uh, th this person is, is citing Detroit Public Schools getting $13,825 per student in 2012-2013. Wyandotte Public Schools the same year got $8,242. appears there's more than enough money. So w could you respond to that formula of where that money is going and who is uh, going to make sure that if uh, the state does help support debt reduction, that the money is spent well. I'd love to. So first take off special education. There is no place in the United States of America that has burdened with special education like the city of Detroit is. $40 million a year, whole, a whole. That's absorbed by the, the general population student. Detroit Public School spends $160 million a year on special ed. It costs $40,000 a year to teach a blind student. That's number one. So that translates into about $1,000 a year per general student. Number two is um, debt. $1,500 a year has been going in debt payments. Okay, That's $2,500. Three, there is a huge disproportionate number of grade school kids versus high school kids that DPS absorbs. Said another way, the charter schools are not taking their proportional share of high school kids today and it costs about twice as much to educate a high school kid than it does a grade school kid. That's another 750 bucks. Then you have MIPSR. If you're comparing against the charter schools, MIPSR costs Detroit almost $2,000 per kid. And then you have a bloated central administration. You have 40,000 extra seats, and I could go on and on and on. $8 million for operators, $10 million for water. The place is out of control. There has to be massive reform now. That all adds up to five, $6,000 a year that they're spending extra in Detroit that Wyandot doesn't have to spend. Take that off of 15 and you're back down to nine. And in fact, if you look at the statistics, Detroit public schools have the least amount of money going into the classroom than any district in the entire state of Michigan. And so I submit to all of you, if that is the case, less money than any other district in the state of Michigan with the kids that are at the absolute highest risk, how are you gonna have success? You failed before you've even started. Dan, that actually leads to a good um, couple of questions here to follow up on, on John's remarks. Why aren't charter schools required to include special ed at every school? And why aren't charter operators required to uh, have a high school as part of their system? Because it does cost more, and the suspicion is perhaps they don't because it's more profitable to operate elementary schools. Let me, let me go back. I wouldn't argue with John about numbers. I actually served on his coalition subcommittee. Nobody works harder at digging into these numbers than John. So there's problems, and John's identified them. What I disagree with is the lens. Uh, charter schools are required to have special ed students. The numbers, when you look at them, they're comparable. Uh, they're they're comparable. Uh, well, there seems to be a little... Uh... Okay, let me... I don't want to question your numbers, Dan, but... Perhaps you could elaborate. Uh, when one of the numbers that John looked up in his subcommittee was when you look at DPS, if you're comparing charters to DPS, that's true. DPS over identifies special education kids than any other urban district in Michigan, any other urban district in the country. So charters may not have that number, but they've got statewide averages. Um, and the special ed system in the city or in, the, in Wayne County does not work well. We don't have access to some of the services right now we're having a hard time accessing even money that's available to charter schools for special education services. I, I agree with John, it needs to be separated and addressed, particularly in Wayne County because it's a unique way we handle special education in this state and we ought to fix it. Uh, if, the, if part of that is holding schools accountable so they make sure they've got them, then we should. 
But uh, funding, funding is different. P Mary, part of it is that. You wanna have the same expectations? Why aren't we funding all kids the same? The proposal we support, that I support in fixing DPS will mean an additional $41 per student to DPS. That expands what they already get that's over what charter schools get. The $200 million startup costs, that's about $2,000 per student. I'm not gonna get that. Those $185 or 185 uh, teachers are gonna come out of my schools. They're gonna use those dollars to come and recruit our teachers and then I'm gonna have to fill them with less dollars. So we are providing high schools. We do have an obligation to do special ed. We need to fix those things for sure. Who's gonna fix them? There. How are we gonna do that? Can I just answer on the, pub, yeah. on the, I'm gonna go back to the numbers. So actually I looked these up. State average for special ed is 2.5% of the student population. Detroit's at 5%. And the charters are at one and a quarter percent. Okay, so those are the numbers. Detroit has four times the number of special ed kids than the charter schools do. Here's where the thing gets complicated. There's two kinds of special ed kids. There's center-based kids. Center-based kids are kids that have to go to a school because the general school isn't capable of teaching them. Think blind, deaf, severely autistic, and the list goes on and on and on. These are kids that cannot get to school on a regular bus. They go in taxi cabs, they go in Uber cars. Parents drive them. I mean, it's unbelievable. They spend an enormous amount of money just getting the kids to school. By the way, read on page one of my financial analysis right at the top, there is a quote from the Constitution. That's why the state will never get out of DPS. They can't. Those special ed parents will never send their kids to his school because they don't have the facilities. And by the way, it's not cost efficient. That's the first kind of kid. There's 2,000 of those. Let's talk about the second kind of kid. That's the kid that's in school that's been identified as a little learning disabled, dyslexic, and there's about 20 categories. They consider those, they look at those as FTEs. Each one of those kids is sort of like graded as to whether he's almost full-time or maybe only needs one hour of training a week. That's where all the money is being lost. And he is right. They are over-identified because in Detroit public schools, it's much better to identify a kid as special ed because then he gets a special uh, individual education plan. I don't know how much that costs, $500, $1,000. And then that kid gets all the special thing. I believe, may not be true, but I believe that if I were a teacher, and I saw a kid struggling, and I knew that he could have some extra help, because after all, he's getting the least amount of money being spent in the classroom for him, that I'm gonna go ahead and identify him as special ed, because he's gonna get the special help. We've got to fix that. But, in the end of the day, the charter schools are living off of DPS as it pertains to special ed. They each get the same foundational allowance. Okay, I, I wanna, uh, we're gonna allow closing statements in just a minute, but I'd like to ask you both to give a vision for what it should look like in Detroit in public tax financed education and it, <clears throat> as a strategy to retain population in the city of Detroit and also to grow population in the city of Detroit. Dan, you wanna start? Okay, can I share a couple quick facts? Cause it was an important thing here. This You're is gonna have the, a wrap up too, so. Well, I don't wanna, okay. I'd like to All right. cheat, get okay. more. Um, cake and eat it too. Uh, these are facts from the Michigan Department of Ed to John's point about special education. Specific learning impairment, DPS 18%, Detroit charters 22%. Autism spectrum disorder, DPS 9%, Detroit charters two. Cognitive impairment, DPS 19, charters six. Emotional impairment, 4% and 4%. Specific learning disabilities, Detroit Public Schools, 31%. DPS, or, uh, Detroit Charters, 47%. Other health impairments, DPS, 8%. Detroit Charters, 7 What you're seeing there in those numbers is exactly what John said. It depends on those center-based programs and where those kids are and where they're counted. We need to fix the system. Okay. Now, John, why don't you start with a vision of, of a strategy for tax-supported public education in the city of Detroit that will retain population and grow population. That's very easy. Senate Bill 710. <laughs> okay? And you will find out that there is this, you asked about the future of Detroit. If we don't fix this in Detroit, we're going nowhere. 
All of these young people that are moving downtown, tens of thousands of them, are all single. The minute they have their children, their children are school age, they're gone. We need to fix this, and we need to fix it now. We have the vehicle on the table. Nobody else has presented anything close. This is what just frustrates me. I, can't, I just can't imagine a business guy or an or a individual parent saying, there is the solution. It's only five years. We agree, no new charter schools unless you're A or B. We agree, close the bad schools. Okay, if you don't like my plan, show me your plan, and the, Senate, and the House plan doesn't answer those two questions. I just don't get it. Dan? What you heard in the response Senate bill is about governance. I'll go back to my original premise. We need performance. It is something, Mary, that's been missing, and, and no fault of anybody, but do we have a vision for what education the city of Detroit could look like? Not what it is, not what it ought to be in terms of some marginal improvements, a dream, a real vision of what schools could look like, where kids, families, communities, neighborhoods have a chance to go to a variety of different types of schools that fits their need. Maybe they learn online, that's a small percentage of kids, but are we offering that to students? Do we have STEM programs? Do we have aviation programs? Do we have arts programs? Do we have cultural-based programs? These are kinds of things that if you really create, think like economic development, we're not forcing people, you can't regulate that. You create an environment where people will come invest their lives and their capital in making those dreams come true and working with community-based organizations to do that and responding to neighborhood needs and students and communities. That's there. This legislation will never do that. It only can create an opportunity for us to do it. And now to conclude, I think Senator Hansen gets one minute to respond to anything that you have heard. Maybe we'll stretch it to two. Can I uh, borrow this? All right. Um, oh, golly. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and I, I want to thank both of you guys because I know you're both very passionate about your, your thoughts on this. And, I think you've brought up a lot of great points, Dan. Thanks for, for being here. Um, it's just been, it, you know, it's a challenge all the way through. John, thanks for your passion. Um, I do agree 710 is the best one out there, but um, we, that is a, uh, I mean, we have a discussion. It's not a, so much about governance. It's about making sure the kids get the education that they need. There's a fear that it is unfounded that the choice will be taken away. We have been very careful to make sure that choices in every single part of every single bill that we, or every part of the bill that we've looked at, we made sure that the choices are quality choices. We made sure that at the end of the day that, that we're not harming the schools that are in place, because the DEC can't close schools. The school reform office is the only entity that can close schools. We're looking at just trying to, you know, the DEC's real job is to do a, uh, a master plan, if you will, for the schools in Detroit so that we can make sure of where we need schools and then make sure that the, the buildings are available where we need schools so that somebody can come in and educate the kids to the, to the level that they deserve. We need good schools, we need opportunity, and we need to get this debt out of the way so that, that everybody can be successful. This is not about charters, this is not about DPS, this is about the kids and we need to quit having these adult arguments and continue to talk about making sure the kids get the education they need. And now the final, for the final wrap up, Tanya Allen. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Senator Hansen, excuse me. Thank you, John, and thank you, Dan. Um, I have heard this quote, and I think it's extraordinarily important, and it basically goes something like this. If a flower isn't thriving, you don't fix the flower, you fix the soil. And that's the problem we have in Detroit, is that we have schools in Detroit and they're not thriving because the soil is broken. Um, and so I uh, appreciate all of the commentaries about adults 
But here's the thing, who's gonna fix it? Adults. And at some point or another, we have to make a decision to take away the things that don't work and add things that do work. Because the status quo is not going to continue. If we let it continue, it does not improve the quality of schools for children. If we could have done all of these things, I think in a voluntary basis, we would have done them by now. So we have to have some level of accountability that allows us to, um, uh, to fix uh, the schools uh, and make sure that the teachers have the resources they need and that children are thriving. And that's ultimately, um, I think, all of our goals. And we just have to push beyond, I think, our own perspectives to find the right solution that will fit for our particular time. Uh, and if we, my belief, is that we're gonna get that through this legislation, that we will win. And if we don't win on this, it doesn't matter because the one thing I would say to you, we will win because all of us, we kind of like, I think part of what has been amazing about this whole process is that we have awakened the, um, the people, all of us, about what's happening in our state and the status quo isn't working. So, um, so thank you for just indulging me there. You know, it was so hard to sit over there and listen to them talk about it without jumping off. I, I did have one outburst, so I apologize. <laughs> but outside of that, I just want to thank, thank our guests, um, our moder our um, panelists, and thank all of you. And uh, the chamber has um, a uh, chart down. Oh, it's outside the door. If you'd like to support and sign your name um, to help us move forward, the legislation, um, Senate, Pen Senate Bill 710 and 711, uh, and uh, to support the Detroit Education Commission, we would appreciate that. Again, thank you all. Thank you, John, and thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. I don't want to miss the opportunity because John said it at the beginning. Our worst enemies here are us. Please don't leave this room thinking that legislation, that legislation alone is going to do everything we want it to do. What will happen after legislation will define who we are and whether we're really serious about making education in the city work. That will all have to come back together and do whatever it takes to get there. Please don't forget that. Thank you. And we need a structure to do that.